Yeah. So if we uh, start out with the why, why am I here? Um, I have, this is my connections to Notre Dame. I was a resident in Chicago. I treated the head athletic trainer's dad's foot with a diabetic foot ulcer. And then um, I moved back to my hometown in Palo Alto, California to practice. And they brought in three, they brought in the, the team was playing Stanford. And uh, the team doctors were my docs growing up. But I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second. So they had three guys with turf toe, and I came up with this idea of a turf toe plate, which I, I made, and um, they used it. They used it successfully, and that, you know, someone else, I, I talked to Chris Adams this, during the break, and he said, we'll never make any money off our invention, so I definitely didn't do it off of that. Um, see, how do we advance this one? This looks like the remote control of the TV. Is that? I'm, I'm, this is not the TV guy that's doing a good job. I could just do it off of here. But if we try, I just do it off of here. There we go. So um, I'll just do it off of here. That's fine. Um, so uh, my disclosure is the only one was really the shockwave company. So um, like I said, I grew up in Palo Alto, California. These two guys were saints. They're my docs growing up. Uh, Fred Bailing in the middle uh, passed, but he was the founder of AOSSM. Gordy Campbell's still alive, 95 years old. And um, I was a student at Washington University, St. Louis. And I met a podiatrist and the podiatrist was treating runners and doing foot and ankle surgery. And so when I was applying to for med school, these guys knew me as a high school kid. And they said, you know what? You should go into podiatry because we don't really like treating these runners and we don't do foot and ankle surgery. So I had no idea what that meant in the orthopedic versus podiatry world. But just so you know, like I, I didn't know about the bias growing up. and. Um, I had a navicular stress fracture that no one in the podiatry school could diagnose, even though at the time Michael Jordan was going through his. I thought I had a navicular stress fracture, but everybody thought it was something different, so I just kept running. And um, so I, that kind of piqued my interest in these. And, um, and they just sort of kind of migrated to me. I'm not sure why, but it's kind of funny talking about this bone that just has a little crack in it that is causing so much problem for people. Um, I was at the Olympics and I had 10 patients compete. And on the final day, four competed, one won a gold. Um, and three of them had navicular injuries. And um, so it's very prevalent in track and field, but it's prevalent in a lot of other sports. And people still think you should treat all of them non-surgically, but I think my data shows that that's probably false. And if you follow people long enough, one of the things Fred Bailey taught me was that he regretted never publishing his results. He saw his patients every year for certain procedures, like a shoulder procedure and an ACL procedure. But he never wrote them up. So I adopted that as part of my practice management. I just said, just come in once a year, show me your foot or whatever I operated on. And I like collecting data. Um, so um, the navicular injuries are problematic. And um, we collected the data from uh, a group of patients, a cohort, after one of my uh, first couple papers and, and published this. So hopefully... You guys had access to this, but um, first diagnosing it, the bone does not bleed a lot. So if it doesn't bleed a lot, it doesn't bruise or swell a lot, but patients will tell you it hurts when I go up on my toes and uh, it throbs and aches at night and I can run 70 miles a week, but when I do speed work, it really hurts and I'm limping after. And then the next clue uh, to diagnosing these is to uh, ask the history of what type of shoes you run because right now carbon fiber shoes are really popular and they make you run faster and you recover faster. And the problem with the carbon plate or the problem with the human foot is the carbon plate will bend where it's meant to bend or where it has a fulcrum, but your foot won't necessarily bend at that same fulcrum. So what happens, things break or things tear. And uh, I've operated on seven navicular stress fractures so far this year. Seven out of 11 all had one brand of shoes. Um, so, and uh, that brand of shoes sponsors one of the national teams. So we did a paper on carbon shoes with navicular injuries, but we threw a, authors from a couple different countries so that, that one country won't lose its uh, sponsorship. Um, I see, seem to find a correlation after ankle sprains and people who have ankle impingement um, that seems to be associated with high arch feet tend to get it, but 
When I got mine, I've got relatively flat feet and I was running in a rigid orthotic with a high arch. So you, cr you take a flexible foot, you put them in a rigid orthotic device, uh, you can develop a navicular stress fracture. And I realize there's a lot of things I'm at odds on with my profession and probably um, that's one of them. Uh, I don't think a lot of people need orthotic devices, but um, this is the first paper we did, a couple colleagues, collect our data. Um, I'm pretty good at recognizing patterns and uh, I was seeing this pattern of prolonged healing, the more the fracture propagated into the navicular. So I came up with this classification system and um, basically the healing time did take longer, the, the more involved it was and the coronal view on the CT is the most critical thing, particularly getting small bone cuts, which is what they call less than 0.6 millimeters. So you have to really ask if, uh, for uh, 0.6 millimeter cuts for these. And um, I don't know about sports guys, but um, a lot of sports guys hate MRIs. I hate MRIs. This is a classic example where MRIs miss the navicular. Everybody wants to get an MRI. I do just have a uh, junior college uh, track athlete and we're going to get an MRI because she might have had a list Franks versus some other midfoot injury. And uh, but CTs are the standard for picking up navicular stress fractures. Um, in this paper, uh, the MRI was only accurate about 70% of the time. CT scan was always accurate. And look at the duration of symptoms before people get an accurate diagnosis, almost nine months. Think about what that does to a high school or college kid. Basically, they lose a year at least. And um, again, I, uh, I think the classification has something to do with the outcome. And so I, it's important to, to get that uh, from the outset so you can give them a good prognosis. A 0.5 is no break in the navicular, but it lights up on the, on the MRI. Sometimes you'll follow these with subsequent CTs three to six weeks later and say, oh, shoot, it, it was actually a type 1, or sometimes type 1s become type 2s. Um, and that classification system, uh, my daughter's uh, last year in her ortho training, and it shows up on her orthopedic and training exam. So I try to push... She's going in an upper extremity fellowship next year, but um, I try to show her some stuff. So, yeah, your kids always listen to him. So. Um, no, actually, I got three kids. So, um, the CT scan with spec uh, or the spec with CT is, is a helpful thing if you're really trying to sometimes trigger these things out and also recur at OCDs. Um, I think those are kind of game changers, uh, particularly for recur at OCDs. Um, this is a type. 0.5 just because it isn't broken. Um, and usually you just treat them non-weight bearing. I don't, I don't know how many of you guys use Shockwave. I use a lot of Shockwave. Um, some people don't want to use Shockwave for various reasons, sometimes financial reasons, both plus and minus, um, but it can enhance your outcomes. Um, and uh, this is a uh, elite sprinter. She actually won a gold medal this past Olympics. I type what I treat her with Shockwave. And uh, we use focus shockwave. There's three types of shockwave, just so you know. There's radio, which is superficial, focus, which is all sonic and goes deep. The third type is electromagnetic field, which is 10 times stronger than a bone stimulator. Um, so um, use that on her. It hurts a little bit, but, you know, most athletes can take a little bit of pain. I, I've had 24 broken or dislocated bones, so I, I'm kind of not going to be too empathetic sometimes. But um, this is a type to acute and a type two chronic. If you have the chronic ones, I mean, I, I, I just don't think, I, I haven't seen those heal. You really gotta take them a surgery and put bone graft in them. Um, the type two acute ones, you don't necessarily need bone graft, sometimes you do PRP. Um, this person's been t uh, casted twice, um, non-weight bearing for six weeks and it's just, yeah, I don't know, one strike, you're pretty much out for me. And if it's a complete type three, I would take them to surgery if they're an athlete. Um, and uh, this is one with cystic changes. So these are bad prognosis because as I said, a lot of times not getting diagnosed leads arthritis. So TN or NC fusions down the road. Um, I make my incision without a tourniquet. Uh, there's a lot of variability in anatomy there. I, don't, I do a lot of things percutaneously and minimally invasive, but I, you get one pseudo aneurysm and that thing pumping at you post-op day number one or two, and you call the vascular surgeon and you know, they usually just inject fiber. But um, so I make an incision, I go down to bone or the capsule, and then I put up the tourniquet. Um, I just 
you know, I think that's safer. Uh, so a lateral to neurovascular bundle, I usually use a partially threaded 4.0 screw. Uh, sometimes go by bi cortical and use a 3.5 or two 3.5s in larger people. But since I've had enough of this uh, experience, I think the correlation with non-union is uh, higher with two screws. I just, I'm a, I'm a data guy. I went back to get my MPH and I'm pretty good at statistics. So, um, and I use bone just from the calcaneus. You don't need a lot of bone. I don't think you need to, I mean, I, I can't go to the hip, so maybe that's a bias right there, but I don't think you need something from the hip. Um, Fred Bailing used to do my hip grafts and he used to tell the patient as they're wheeling in, you know, I've operated on your surgeon. So, um, so he liked, he liked doing cases with me in his later years. Um, so non-surgical treatment, uh, I think there's a role for that. I think if you have access to focus shockwave, you're going to improve your outcomes, both surgically and non-surgically. Um, the other data point, if you get this treated non-surgically less than 21 years old, you're statistically more likely to refracture. And the problem with just being the team doctor in the colleges, because I have a pretty well-known college across the street from me, they think, oh, we just treat these non-surgically. Don't, they don't follow them. I treat a lot of those patients before they go to Stanford and after they go to Stanford. And at 26, when they decide to pick up a triathlon and their foot explodes, um, they're like, yeah, I, I had an invasive stress fracture treated in college. So um, I've had two refractures. You're never going to be 100%. Um, this is a patient I... I did uh, treat ultra marathon runner, uh, pretty low BMI. I usually run it albumin and uh, chemistry before I, and uh, and uh, panels before I do uh, some of the skinny runners. Um, and uh, she did not heal on CT. Um, I plated it, did bone graft, and she's 39 years old. And and I I tell people I'm the run I'm the doctor. I'll tell you if you can run, and I'll tell you if you can't run. And um, I tell people to ration their running, but they don't always listen. So she kept running and I, she's not, this is her, she's not healed, but she says she's going to keep running. So um, this is not my patient, but a football player and um, a fracture, you know, around the screw. That's not great. Um, this is pa uh, patient on the left had two screws, headless screws. I, I don't like headless screws. I, I think they're a pain to remove. My, my sayings never put something in you might have to take out. And this was also impinging on the cuneiform and cuboid. They, uh, they had ample amount of shockwave post-op. Um, and so I just replated it three months ago. This is a three, three months CT, CT scan. So he's healed. Um, sometimes the screws migrate or you, you compress the bone. And um, that happens more in younger people. This is a young person in a car accident. Not quite an avicular stress fracture, but similar pathology. Um, where it's not healing. Um, so I use arthrodiastasis for the younger patients who are trying to get the joint open and plate it. Um, this is the world record holder of the marathon two months before the Olympics in 2012, and she basically couldn't walk her foot, totally decompensated. And um, she was told she needed tail and navicular fusion, and um, she said, no, I don't. And uh, so I did the arthrodiastasis. Um, I usually put the rail on uh, immediately. Um, that lady that was a world record holder, she's going to run two marathons next year. She's still running 70 plus miles a week. Um, this is her foot. Um, and then the uh, OCDs that kind of act like stress fractures, same thing. I do um, arthrodiastasis and credit. I usually put the rail on immediately again because it seems to do better for the scars. I, I saw her. She's 15 years post-op and... Um, she still runs. She's a PA for an ortho group in the, in the Mammoth area. Um, this paper is interesting to me because they talk about vascularized bone graft, but it's interesting they used to take the, the graft local. Now they take it from the knee, so I'm not sure if the local graft didn't work. Um, I think there's a role for that. I just haven't done it. And uh, I'm good friends with Bob Anderson, and, and uh, he keeps prodding me to write up an algorithm, so I use some of my MPH stuff to come up with the algorithm. Um, which I'll, I'll, I can provide for you. And I, again, using some of my recent training, I, I like to optimize outcome. Everybody wants to heal faster. So I use one focus shockwave, two EMTT shockwaves, and um, on a match set analysis in 12 patients of, that had 
just the control. And they were statistically had lower pain when weight bearing, statistically more likely to return to activity faster and have healing radiographically at four weeks. So this is just value added for your for your surgery. Some people say, I don't want to do that because then they won't do surgery, but I do it to improve my outcome. So just in conclusion, the harder ones to see are sometimes easier to fix and they get better prognosis. The ones that are easy to see, you're kind of got, got to give them bad news because um, they get DJD and, and have different options like external fixation. And overall, there's about a 10% hardware removal rate and uh, 5% refracture rate in the athlete. And um, I, again, just the CT scan is really important. So yeah, I want to thank Bob and for pushing me to keep collecting data on this. And um, my connection to Notre Dame, besides the, besides the um, trainer, is uh, my brother was uh, one of the coaches for the soccer team for the, for the programs. And I had two friends' kids uh, run here and track. I think you have to be over six feet to go to school here. My son qualified. Anyway, I appreciate having the opportunity. I appreciate the brace. (laughs) 